All right. Well, good morning. Welcome to another great day of calculus. Uh, Friday the 13th, uh, 2020. Oh, yeah, which means something fun's going to happen today, right? Uh, anyway, so um, the plan today, we've been talking a lot about, um, you know, things that we can use to help us draw graphs of functions. And so we're going to kind of wrap that all up today. Um, we'll kind of do another example where we use everything, first derivative, second derivative, asymptotes, right, all this stuff to get a decent uh, graph of uh, function. Um, so we're going to do that. And then we're going to turn our attention to what's called optimization. And optimization um, is really what it sounds like, trying to get the best case results um, and seeing how we can use calculus to help us in problems where we're trying to get uh, a maximum return or a minimum uh, some type. But before we do that, as always, I want to open it up to any questions from the homework or anything else we've been talking about. Is there anything... Uh, you'd like to discuss before we get going? All right, well, hearing none and seeing none, I will uh, hop up to the whiteboard and see you guys in just one second. All right, so um, as promised, let's actually put all this stuff that we've been working on the last week or so, let's put it all together um, with an example, just so you can kind of see how powerful this calculus is and how much we can actually do um, when it comes to drawing the graph of a function where we have zero technology, where we have absolutely nothing, um, but we can still get excellent graphs. All right, so the function I want to look at is this guy right here. Let's look at y equals x squared over x minus 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw a graph of this thing. And we're going to do it as, as well as we can by looking at things like where is it increasing, where is it decreasing, where is it concave up, where is it concave down. Um, intercepts, asymptotes, domain, like everything that we've ever seen, let's apply it to this. Okay, so um, I'm going to start making a list of things that we can do, and I'm actually going to start with non-calculus, okay, because there's a lot that we can tell about this that doesn't require any calculus at all, all right, so um, up here I'm going to put a list. So let's put here non-calculus. Okay, so non-cal. So things that we can look for. The domain. You guys know how to find domain, things that you want to look for. Uh, division by zero, square roots of negative numbers, that sort of thing. Um, but let's check the domain of this function. All right, so can anybody tell me what the domain of that function is? x squared over x minus 1. x not equal to 1. Good. So we can have all x's not equal to 1. All right. So in this case, its domain is x not equal to 1. All right. So that means that something funky is going on at 1. Um, and what is that here? What's going to show up on the graph of this function at 1? Oh, it's going to be one of those days, huh? Horizontal asymptote. Uh, close. Vertical, wait, vertical asymptote. Yep, there you go. Thanks, Susanna. All right, so the domain, we know that x cannot equal 1, which means in this case, we're going to get a vertical asymptote. I'm going to put here VA. So we know that we've got a vertical asymptote at x equal 1. Okay, so that's a non-calculus thing. Pretty easy to check. Now, another thing that we can do non-calculus 
is find any intercepts of this function, right? The intercepts of this graph, um, we figure those out by plugging in x equals zero or setting y equals zero. Um, if we let x equal zero, you'll see we get zero squared over negative one, which is zero. So um, we know that there's going to be a y-intercept at zero, zero. So this is gonna go through the origin. Um, in terms of x-intercepts, if we take that entire function and set it equal to zero, that only happens when the top is equal to zero. So not only is that the y-intercept, it's also the only x-intercept. Right, so I was gonna put here also x intercept zero comma zero. So there's just an algebra step. So we know that the only place that's gonna cross the x-axis is at the origin. And that is the place where it crosses the y-axis as well. All right, so there's a uh, domain and intercepts. Um, some other things that we can do that uh, we can check that we're non-calculus. Th these are the two I highly recommend you always do. But some other things you can do, you can check symmetry. Symmetry is the plug in negative x and see what happens. Um, if you get the exact same thing out, it's got even symmetry. If you get the opposite sign, you get odd symmetry. Um, actually, let me show you how that would play out here. So if I plugged in negative x, so this is, this is going to be a symmetry test. So notice what I'm doing is everywhere there was an x, I'm putting in a negative x. And if I kind of simplify this a bit, I'm going to get a positive x squared on top and a negative x minus one on the bottom. So <clears throat> is this the same thing as what we started with? Well, the answer to that is no. We've got a negative x here. Is it the opposite of what we started with? Did we just change the sign? And the answer to that is also no. Yeah, we did change the sign on this x, but we didn't change the sign on everything. So since neither of those happen, this doesn't have any symmetry. If you're a little bit cloudy on that, please go back and review it. Um, I know I talked about it on day one even. It's a reminder, so you can go back and look at chapter one and it'll talk about symmetry. Um, but it's something that's non-calculus. That's actually not terribly hard to do, but um, if we have symmetry, that will help us when it comes time to draw in the graph. All right, so we have domain, intercepts, symmetry, and, and those are really the big things that we can do non-calculus wise. Okay, so then what about calculus? Let's make a list for things that we can do with calculus. Okay, so the first is gonna be increasing and decreasing. I'm actually gonna make my list of things and then we'll find them all. So we're gonna look for where it's increasing and decreasing. Attached to that, we're gonna look for extrema. Do we have any maxes? Do we have any mins? And those both come from the first derivative. We're also gonna look for concavity. Determine where it's concave up and concave down and then Attached to that, we're going to look for inflection points. Remember that inflection points, those are the places where we change concavity from concave up to concave down, or vice versa. And those two come from the second derivative. And then I'm going to put here number five. We're going to determine end behavior. Meaning, let's look at what happens as we go towards infinity. And so that's what we're going to we're going to use what we talked about last time to do that. Okay, so these are things that we're going to do from calculus. Um, and then once we have all of that, we'll put it together to see what the graph of this thing looks like.
All right, so to accomplish this, let's start with some derivatives, some second derivatives, and then we'll also look at the limit as we go to infinity. All right, so let's do it. Let's go and get derivatives. So we've got x squared over x minus one. That of course means we need to use the quotient rule. All right, well, f prime or y prime is gonna be the derivative of the top, 2x times the bottom, x minus one, minus the derivative of the bottom times the top. So that's gonna be one times x squared divided by the bottom squared. So if I distribute through, I'm going to get x squared minus 2x. And that's going to be all over x minus 1 quantity squared. So that x squared minus 2x just came from distributing grouping like terms and simplifying. All right, so we good there. Any questions on the derivative? All right, so now let's use the derivative. Let's figure out where it's increasing and decreasing, and let's find extrema. All right, so what we have to do is, again, find out where this is 0 and where this is undefined. And those are all the different places that could be extrema. And then we can break up the real number line and test. So let's start with where this equals 0. So this is going to equal zero when the top is equal to zero, which if I factor out an x gives me two places, x equals zero and x equals two. So those are two places where the derivative is actually equal to zero. Are they extrema? We'll find out. Okay, and then the other thing we have to do is look at where this thing is undefined. And this is going to be undefined where the bottom is equal to zero, which gives me one more place, which is x equal one. So we're actually going to take the real number line, split it into four pieces using those three numbers, and then we'll test. All right, so here's how that's going to play out. Cutting the real number line at 0, 1, and 2. And so the question is, let's look at the sign of the derivative, plus or minus. Uh, let's look at the sign of the derivative, and um, therefore we'll know increasing or decreasing. All right, so I'm going to help ourselves out a little bit. Let's look at this fraction. The bottom is always positive, because we're squaring x minus 1. So the sign of the derivative is only going to be determined by the sign of the number on top. Okay, so we only have to look at the top and see if it's positive or negative. So for example, if we plug in a number bigger than 2, like 10, 10 squared minus 2 times 10, that, that'd be 80. That's positive. So that tells me that I'm increasing when I'm greater than 2. Now, if we try something between 1 and 2, what you're going to see is that this is actually negative. Like plug in 1 and a half, for example. 1 and a half squared is 2 and a quarter. 2 times 1 and a half is 3. 2 and a quarter minus 3 is negative 0.75. So that's going to be negative, which means our function is decreasing. All right, between zero and one, again, plug in like half, you're gonna see that there, it's also decreasing. And then if you plug in a negative number, you'll see that this is actually positive because a negative number is gonna make, well, the first one squared is positive and then subtracting two times a negative is gonna make that positive as well. 
Okay, so we actually know everything about this in terms of increasing and decreasing, which means we also know about extrema, right? So let's write down what we know from this. We know that it's going to be increasing from minus infinity to zero and from two to infinity. It's going to be decreasing zero to one and one to two. And so in terms of extrema, there's going to be a max at zero, zero, right? There's a max when x is zero, and when x is zero, my function is equal to zero. And then there's a min at We already knew that at one, there's a vertical asymptote. So it couldn't have been an extreme, but we definitely see that it can't be an extreme because it's decreasing on both sides. of. All right, so that's everything the derivative tells us. So we're starting to, starting to come together. But now let's move on to the second set of two here, concavity and inflection points, which requires us to get the second derivative. So that's what we'll do next. But before I go there, questions on the first derivative? We have any questions there? You are plugging those x points into y prime, right? The, when you said, when I said like, I plug in a number between one and two, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, when I'm testing the increasing and decreasing, I'm going to the derivative because it's the sign of that that tells me increasing or decreasing. And, and the reason I asked for clarification is because when it came to finding the maximum and minimum points, for those points, I went back to the function. So when you are finding points, use the function if you're looking for just increasing, decreasing, you test using the, uh, the first derivative. But you knew there are max and min just based on where it's increasing and decreasing, right? Exactly. Yeah, uh, basically I use the first derivative test. All right, I'm going from increasing to decreasing. That tells me I've got a max. Here I'm going from decreasing to increasing. That tells me I've got a min. All right, good question, Alia. Any others? Okay, well, let's go check concavity and inflection points, which means we need the second derivative. All right, well, so the second derivative, again, is gonna require quotient rule. We're gonna differentiate our derivative. So y double prime, we're gonna get two X minus two times X minus one squared minus two times X minus one times X squared minus two X. I apologize, I'm running out of room. Let me see if I can scoot this over a little bit. All right, and then that's all divided by x minus one to the fourth. So that was just quotient rule on this guy. Now, this one I'm gonna simplify a little bit. I definitely wanna get it into a more useful form. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cancel out an x minus 1 from each of the pieces. Notice that on top, 
this first term has an x minus one squared, the second term has an x minus one, and the bottom has a whole bunch of x minus ones. So I'm going to cancel them. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to distribute and group like terms, do a little bit of algebra. I have to FOIL here on the left, and then you know FOIL and distribute over here as well. Um, in terms of the x squareds, I'm going to get 2x squared minus 2x squared, so those are all gone. In terms of the x's, I'm going to get minus 2x, another minus 2x, so that's minus 4x, plus 4x. Okay, so those are all gone. And then if I go to the constants, it's just 2. So that second derivative looked really messy when we started with the quotient rule, but look at how nice and easy or nice and simple it becomes once we do the algebra on it. Is that squared on the bottom or cubed? It's a cube on the bottom. There were four of them, now there are three. All right, so I definitely pulled some algebra tricks there. Um, again, you can go back and, and work it out yourself, but you'll see it eventually becomes this. Okay, so now we need to do the same thing that we did with the first derivative, which is look at where this is equal to zero and where it's undefined. So in terms of undefined, I think that might be a little bit easier. Um, we look at where the bottom is equal to zero. And we see that it's going to be undefined at x equals 1. So that's going to be one of the places that we have to worry about changing uh, concavity. Um, and then we need to see where is this equal to 0. Well, it turns out this is also really easy, but it's one of those things that most people are really uncomfortable with. This thing is never equal to 0. And the reason I know is that the top which is a two, the top is never equal to zero. There are no X's. The absence of X's usually makes people freak out a little bit, but algebraically it's really nice. If there are no X's, there's nothing to do, there's nothing to solve. So it turns out we only have to worry about one place here in terms of concavity changes. Okay, and that's only at X equals one. So we only have to check numbers that are either bigger than one or smaller than one, looking at the second derivative and seeing what its sign is, it's plus or minus sign. So let's take a number bigger than one, like two, for example. If I plug that in here into the second derivative, I'm going to get two over one cubed, which is two. It's a positive number. So that tells me that over here, I'm concave up. If I plug in a number less than one, like zero, for example, I'm going to get two over negative one cubed. Well, negative one cubed is still negative. So this result is a negative number, which tells me it's concave down. So in terms of concavity, this was actually pretty fast because of the form of the second derivative. So here's what we know. We know that it's concave up from 1 to infinity, and it's concave down from minus infinity to 1. Okay, So it's going to be shaped like a frown until we get to 1, or it's going to be as if it were fitting on a frown as we get up to 1. And then it's going to look like it fits on a cup or a smile once we get past one. All right, so there's our concavity. So if you can think back to that list of calculus steps uh, or calculus items, that was the third one, concavity. So what about inflection points? Do we have any? 
Do we have any points where we change concavity? At one. Okay, so we see at one, we change from being concave down to concave up. Oh, but this was a horrible trick question. Because while it changes concavity there, it's not an inflection point. Wait, what? What's going on? Why isn't that an inflection point? I know it's way too early for quite horrible questions like that. Um, what's going on at one? What's going on with this function at x equal one? Okay, so I'll just put asymptote with the question mark. Yeah, asymptote. We know there's a vertical asymptote. We know that one's not even in the domain of this function. So there is no point there. So you can't have an inflection point if you don't have a point. So even though we changed concavity, that doesn't mean that we actually have an inflection point. You have to have a point for there to be an inflection point. Um, we saw a similar thing happen with um, maxes and mins. Like you can be increasing and then decreasing and not have uh, an extreme value. Those things tend to happen at asymptotes. Okay, so basically what's going on here is we've got the vertical asymptote and we're changing concavity on either side. All right, so horrible trick question. I'm glad that you were thinking though, ooh, one is a special place because we're changing concavity. Um, it's just, it's not a point. So I'm gonna put here, no inflection points. All right, so that's what all of that tells us. So if you think back or go back and you look at that list, we're cruising along. And the last thing that we can do now with calculus is what we were doing last time, which is let's look at the limit as we go to infinity. Let's go back to this function and let's look at the limit and see if that gives us uh, any good information in terms of asymptotes. All right, so asymptotes or uh, limits it to infinity or at infinity. Um, we just need the original function, so we don't have to worry about derivative or anything. Um, so looking at this, what can you tell me about what happens as we go to infinity? What happens to x squared over x minus one? One. All right. So Ben, uh, I think it was Ben. Really just said one with a question in his voice. What do you guys think? Does it go to one? Because infinity over infinity is one, I think. All right. So because infinity over infinity equals one. Unfortunately, not always. Infinity over infinity can actually be anything. But I like where you're thinking. What's the trick we can use? You remember the trick with rational expressions? This is where we want to look at the degrees. What degree do we have? So the top is degree two, the bottom is degree one. So the top's got a bigger degree than the bottom. So what does that tell you? Good, errors just typed in the chat box, infinity. Um, at this point, what we know, because the degree on top is bigger than the degree on the bottom, we know that the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared over x minus one is infinite. And in fact, it's positive infinity because of the fact that it's a positive number when we plug in something way down the line there. Um, and similarly, if we were to put in the negative, so if we took at the limit as x goes to minus infinity, that's going to give us negative infinity because now the top would be a positive number, the bottom would be a negative number. So we're going to get a negative, but big. 
So <clears throat> watch out for that. When you have infinity over infinity, you can get different things. Um, the trick really is to look at the degrees. Look at the degrees of the polynomials. If the one on top is bigger, it goes to infinity or minus infinity, it blows up. If the one on bottom is bigger, it goes to zero. If they're the same degree, that's where we do that trick of looking at the coefficients, the leading terms, the coefficients on the leading term. Okay, so this one, we know as we go out towards infinity, it's just gonna keep going up. And as we go towards negative infinity, it's gonna keep going down. All right, so no horizontal asymptotes. However, this one's got an oblique asymptote, one of those slant asymptotes, because the top is one degree higher than the bottom. So I want to find it. I want to see what that slant asymptote is. So we're going to do polynomial long division. So let's find it. So we're gonna take x minus one, and we're gonna divide that into x squared. Dangerously close to the reflection there. Let me actually do this in darker pen. All right, so here we go. X, to get X squared, I have to multiply by X. That gets me an X squared minus X, but I need to subtract. So X squared minus X squared is zero. And then I've got zero minus a negative X, which gives me a positive X. So now X, to get X, I have to multiply by one. So that gives me x minus 1. I subtract that off. x minus x is 0. 0 minus negative 1 is 1. All right, so this then tells me what my oblique asymptote is. It's y equals x plus 1. So I'm going to write that down here. So we've got an oblique asymptote. And it's at y equals x plus 1. So this is even better than knowing that we're going to infinity. Because now I know how we're going to infinity. It's going to start looking like the line y equals x plus 1 when I get really far away. And that's going to be far away up in either side. Whew. OK, so we have now done all of the work. And now we're ready to synthesize all this information. We're going to take all of this and put it together to get a hopefully very good graph of this function. Bruce, right. can you remind us why you did division for the oblique asymptote? Um, Because that's the process. Uh, it, yeah, that's really the answer. Is it when it's degree, when it's one degree higher, if you do the division, the remainder piece, the one over x minus one ends up going away. And so what uh, it's going to look like is the quotient piece. And that's why you do the long division. So and, what, and what triggered me to do that, and maybe that's what you're really asking, what triggered me to do that was the degree on top was one more than the degree on the bottom. OK. So if you ever have the degree on top one more than the one on the bottom, you know you're going to have an oblique asymptote. All right, what other questions do we have at this point? Again, before I, I just want to make sure we're clear on all of the steps, everything that we've done.
before we try to put it together. Any other questions? All right, so let's do this. Let's take all this information and put it together. So uh, I'm just gonna write the concavity stuff down here again. Because I'm going to drop the picture up here. So, all right, so all the information that we found is down here at the bottom. So, let's put it all together, draw this graph. All right, so I'll put on some axes over here. And I will do my best again to be kind of precise with distances. So I'm gonna put some tick marks here so we can get all of our points and everything. All right, so let's just start from the top. So things we knew, there's a vertical asymptote at x equals one. Okay, so there's our vertical asymptote. I'm gonna put check marks as we take care of them. All right, uh, there's a y-intercept at zero, zero. It's also an x-intercept, but it's the one and only intercept. All right, so there's that point, zero, zero, check. Um, there is no symmetry. We'll see that as we continue drawing our graph. Um, let's see, okay, we've got an oblique asymptote at y equals x plus one. All right, well, let's look at what that line would be. Here's the plus one, it's got a slope of one. So there's our oblique asymptote. All right, a check mark next to that. All right, so now let's take care of this increasing, decreasing with extrema and concave up and concave down. All right, so let's start with, we've got a max at zero, zero. So this point right here is gonna be a maximum. There's gonna be a minimum over at two, four. Okay, so two, four, here's two, two, three, four. I think this is two, four right here. And I know that's going to be a minimum on the left over here, right? It's increasing and then decreasing, and it's also concave down. So that means what I'm going to see is a frown shape that's going to approach the asymptotes. So notice how it's concave down. And we've got our increasing and then decreasing that gave us our max. On the other side, 2, 4 is a min, but it has to be concave up. So it has to be on a cup. So it's going to have to look like it's on a cup or a smile. Um, and it's also going to need to be approaching those asymptotes with the minimum there at two, four. All right, so we just took care of all of these guys as well. So let me just circle back to symmetry, because remember we saw that we shouldn't have any symmetry. It's not even and it's not odd. And you can see that here. 
right? It's not even, we can't reflect, if we were to reflect it over the x-axis, we would get a different picture than this one. And if we were to rotate it, half a rotation about the origin, we get a different picture, so it's not odd. So it definitely matches the fact that we shouldn't have any symmetry. All right, well, there you go. There's the graph of y equals x squared over x plus one. Um, but like always, I am gonna show you how terribly awesome we are at this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll take a look at what Desmos says this thing should look like. All right, so everybody can see the screen. Yep, yeah. okay. So let's type this sucker in and let's see what it looks like. So we've got y equals x squared divided by x minus one. Yeah, I'd say we nailed it. You can see all those same features that we saw that we found, right? Here is the maximum at zero, zero. Here's the minimum at two, four. It's not on here, but you can visualize the vertical asymptote at x equal one. You definitely see the concavity, concave down and concave up. And it definitely looks like there's a linear slant asymptote, right? Um, and so if I were to actually, let me go ahead and put in that equation. The, the line was y equals x plus one. So there is that oblique asymptote that we drew as well. All right, so the power of calculus. And that's, a, that's some serious power right there. There's no need anymore for you to ever require a graphing calculator or a computer to draw you graphs. You have all the tools necessary to do it on your own. Now, obviously you're still gonna use your graphing calculator. You're still gonna plug it into something like Desmos. I do, but it's good that we've got this power if we need it. Uh, my standing joke is the, you know, what if, you get stranded on a deserted island, right? So you're there with your, your one and only friend, your volleyball Wilson. And the only way to get off this island is if you happen to have uh, this graph available. Well, I'm getting off the island. I'm not gonna be stuck there because I don't know the graph of X squared over X minus one. I, I know that's silly because I can't think of a situation where that's the only way that you get off the island. Um, but, you know, it, it's just one of those things. Like, we now have tools that we can use. And um, believe it or not, this is how a lot of graphing programs work. They've got this stuff programmed in it for it. Anyway, all right. So, take this example for what it is. It's actually review of all the stuff that we did the last like week and a half, right? Um, this is a lot of what derivatives allow us to do. Okay, so uh, questions, how are we feeling about this? All right, I just saw a thumbs up from Bailey. Thanks for that, Bailey. Oh, a bunch of thumbs up popping. Um, I know that sometimes at this point people, uh, they feel a little overwhelmed and that's okay. Like I totally get it because we did a lot of stuff here. This one problem, we did a lot. Um, we're taking all these things from uh, different places and, and putting it all together. So um, my recommendation with these is go slow, develop a process, like even write out the list of things you wanna check. Right, like think about how I, I had that list and I wrote them all. And then when I went to graph, in, graph it, I, took, I put a check mark over each thing. Be slow, be systematic. 
develop a process um, and realize that at the start, you're probably going to miss some things. But the more you do it, the more you're going to start recognizing, oh, yeah, don't forget about asymptotes. Don't forget about concavity, you know, whatever happens. Uh, so, Jessica, I see that your little hand icon is up. Did you have a question or was that a, you hit that when you were trying to thumbs up or something? So your, your mute thing went off, but I can't hear you actually. But. Okay, you hit it on accident. That's what I figured. Just wanted to make sure. All right, so now let me show you another big use of derivatives. And this is actually probably um, one of the bigger applications is in optimization. All right, so optimization, what does that mean? Optimization. Okay. So uh, this is one of those places where if we actually think about the standard usage of the word, um, it actually applies to calculus. So when you think about something being optimized, optimizing is like making something the best possible, getting the best possible results. Right? And so optimization is really that. This is the process of trying to find, I'm going to put here this in quotes, best cases. So whatever our situation is, we're trying to find the best possible case. Uh, oh, real quick. So Nancy, I see your hand is up. Is there a question I can answer? Oh no, I think I might have clicked it on accident or something. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, just sorry. To make sure. No worries, no worries. Okay, so we're just trying to find the best case result. All right. Now, in terms of what that means mathematically, this is just a maximum or a minimum. Right? Let's let's just think of some examples where we try to get, you know, best case. Like if you have a business. You probably want to try to optimize your profit, right? You want to be bringing in to your pocket as much money as possible. That's kind of the whole point of having a business, right? Is to make money. So you want to make as much as possible. So you're trying to find a maximum amount of profit. Or maybe you're trying to do something as cheaply as possible. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to minimize your cost, right? So, um, and, and actually that's probably relevant to most of us in our everyday life, right? You're trying to eat, but not spend all the money, right? So you're trying to minimize how much you spend on your groceries, right? Or you're trying to minimize how much electricity you use or things like that, right? So in like a business situation, maxes and mins make total sense. In like, a, you know, like a, a, let's say like a science kind of uh, idea um, or environment, let's say environmental science, take like the lake, Lake Tahoe. One of the things, of course, we care about up at the lake is to keep Tahoe blue, right? We want to keep pollutants out of the lake. So we try to minimize how much pollutant flows into the lake. Right. So optimization, you can probably see, is pretty common where we're trying to get best case results of either a max or a min. Well, if what we're trying to do is figure out maxes or mins, it shouldn't be very hard for you to connect the dots to calculus. Because what are we going to do to figure out maxes and mins? Really? You're going to make me say it? We're going to take a derivative, right? I mean, that, we just did that in that example of drawing a graph, 
we use the derivative to determine maximum and minimum values. Well, we're going to use derivatives to help us optimize. Right. So let me give you an example of a problem. And we'll actually do this. We'll use the calculus on it. And then we'll talk about general process of how this is going to go. All right, so this is an example that probably does not pertain to any of you, will never pertain to any of you, most likely, all right? but um, it's simple and it's easy, and so this is what we're going to start with. So suppose that you have a thousand feet of fencing. And we're going to make a rectangular corral. Okay, so we've got a horse farm, let's say. Um, and uh, so we want to build a little corral for our horses. And we've got a thousand feet of fencing to do it. All right, what I want to know is what dimensions. Should the field have to maximize area? Because we want as much space for our horses to be able to run around in. So I want to take, take this thing and make it so that I got the biggest possible area. So this is an optimization problem. I'm trying to get my best result. In this case, my best case would be the most possible area, but you can see how there's a maximum, right? We're trying to maximize area. So here's a typical optimization problem. All right, well, let, let's see what we're going to do to kind of figure this out. So we've got a rectangular field. Its dimensions are not known, but for right now, how about we just call them x and y? So if I told you the dimensions, right? If I told you x is 500 and y is, you know, 300 or whatever, um, then you could, everything would be known, right? So let's just call those X and Y. So here's what we need to do. We need to maximize area. So we're gonna wanna take a derivative, which means we have to have some sort of a formula or an equation to take a derivative of. Well, we're trying to maximize area. That means we need a formula for area. So hopefully you all remember area. Area of a rectangle is x times y. All right, so that's what we're going to want to differentiate. However, now I know you know how to do this. Like we've done derivatives before where we have more than one variable. Right, we, we've done that with implicit differentiation. But what I'd really like is for this area to be ter in terms of just one of those variables. So that it's only a function of X or only a function of Y. And so here's what we're gonna do. Um, there's a little bit more information that was given to us that we haven't used yet. What haven't we used? Yeah, it's that thousand, right? We have a limited amount of fencing. I only have a thousand feet of fence to build the outside of this. So it's not like I can make this area as big as I want. There is a restriction. Okay, well, let's look at that. We're gonna talk about having a thousand feet of fencing. That's gonna be the perimeter. 
And so what we've got is that the outside, the total of the outside can only be 1000. So don't know if you remember your perimeter formula, but the perimeter of a rectangle, it's 2x plus 2y. And what we know is that that's going to equal 1000. So I can't just randomly choose x and y. I have to be, I, I have to follow this restriction, right? So like if I decided, all right, let's make x 100 feet. So it's going to be 100 feet wide. My y is determined. It's going to be 400 feet long. Right, or if I make my x 200 feet, well, then my y is going to be 300 feet, and so on and so forth. Okay, so there's definitely a restriction. I can't just randomly choose x and y. I've got this relationship. So what I can do is I can actually solve this for one of the letters. I'll go ahead and solve it for y. And I get that y is equal to 500 minus x. And what I can do now is I can take that 500 minus x, put it into the other equation for y. So what that would give me in this specific case, I'm going to get that my area is equal to x times 500 minus x or a is 500x minus x squared. So basically the way this formula works is you tell me how wide the field is, I can tell you what its area is. All right, well, now we're ready to do calculus. Because remember what I want to do is I want to maximize my area. So let's find the maximum for this function. So here's where the calculus is going to come in. Okay, so we're going to find the max. Well, we'll do a prime. The derivative of this is 500 minus 2x. And what we know when we try to find maxes and mins is you know, find out where this is zero or undefined. Well, it's never undefined because it's polynomial, but it does equal zero. And if we solve that for x, we get x equals 250. So 250 is a critical point for the area. But I want to make sure, is it a max? Is that actually going to give us a maximum value? Well, we can test that. We can test it by either the first derivative test, look for increasing and decreasing on either side, or we can use the second derivative test. And that's actually what I recommend here. If you look at the second derivative, the second derivative is negative 2. So it's always concave down. And if we're always concave down, then this thing does have to be a maximum. OK, so this is what's going to lead to our maximum area. If we make it so that the width of this field is 250 feet, we're going to get the biggest possible area. All right, so let's just get the other dimension. If x is 250, what's y going to be? Plug it into the 1,000 one. Yeah, we can just plug it back into this. I, I would just go to the y equals here. If x is 250, 500 minus 250 is 250. OK, so the dimensions, remember the question was, what dimension should the field have to maximize area? 
The answer to that is it should be 250 feet by 250 feet. It actually should be square. If we make this thing square, and remember a square is a rectangle, it's just a special one. Um, but if we make that a square, we're gonna maximize our area. And calculus is what got us there. Right? We were able to differentiate this thing, go through our steps to find critical points and test it to see that it actually gave us our max. All right, so this is a typical optimization problem, right? They, they, are, they all kind of fall out like this. So let's build a plan. Let's build an attack plan for these to see what we did and, and see if we can kind of build a little recipe. Okay, but before I do that, questions on any of the steps that I did? Maybe not the questions of, well, how do you know to do that step? But the actual individual steps, were okay with that? The algebra, the calculus? All right, so I'm not seeing or hearing any questions, so I'm gonna assume we're good. All right, so let's think about a process. Let's just think about, in general, what we need to do. So here's how I kind of break down these problems. Um, I'm going to call this step one, even though it's really the second thing I do. Um, but the first thing you need to do is you need to find an equation for what you are trying to maximize or minimize. So I'm going to put here what you're trying to optimize. Okay, so we need to find an equation for what we're trying to optimize. In this case, that was area. So it's usually pretty clear from the context of the question what it is you're trying to optimize, because it'll tell you. It'll say things like, in this case, find the dimensions that maximizes area, or you know, find out how many snowboards you need to make to maximize your profit, or determine you know, whatever to minimize cost. Or it, it's pretty clear what we're trying to optimize. So basically, I read this problem and I go, okay, cool. I need to get a formula for area. So A equals XY. Now, usually, usually this formula, will be in terms of more than one variable. Kind of like what we had here, right? Area was x times y. So once we figure out the formula for what we're trying to optimize, what we need to do is we need to make it so that this has only one variable. Okay, so I'm gonna put here, turn this or turn it into an equation. of only one variable. And that's what we did here when we the y equals 500 minus x, and we put it in. Um, because there's usually a restriction. There's usually some kind of a restriction on what these variables can have. All right, and that's what we had here with this 1,000, 1,000 feet of fencing. Um, we actually call this, there's a name for this. This is called a constraint. So all a constraint is, is just, it's a restriction. It's a limitation on what your values can be. And since we're trying to do things in the real world here, right? This is where we're using calculus to, to uh, get us real world things. The real world has restrictions. I can't make this field have infinite size. Right? Theoretically, that's great. But in the real world, no, I can't. I have a constraint. I have a restriction. 
I only have so much fencing, right? Or I only have so many people working, or I only have so much water flow into the lake, or I only have, right? There's always going to be some kind of a restriction. And we use that constraint to turn this thing into a function of just one variable. Okay, so then once we're there, this is where life gets good again. Now we just do the calculus. You're going to like step number three. In fact, that's the only part of these problems that you're going to like um, is step number three, because steps one and two, this is tough. This requires a lot of thought. Every problem is different. But once you get that equation, then we can just go into autopilot and we can do our calculus. Um, this is kind of like back when we did related rates. You remember related rates. And I know you didn't like them. And why were related rates questions hard? Well, it's kind of the same thing. You had to find the equation that had the relationship between the quantities so that then you could differentiate. And it was that building the equation that was difficult. Well, same thing's going to happen here. Building of the equation, that's what's going to be the challenge for us. Because once we've got it, yeah, then we just do calculus. No problem. Uh, hopefully, I, I don't know if you remember, but at the very beginning of this class back in September, I told you calculus isn't hard. I don't know if you still believe me or if you've even thought about that. But I still contend calculus is not hard. It's everything else we have to do to do the calculus that's hard. It's the creating the equations. It's the doing the algebra to simplify later. It's a, that's what makes this stuff challenging. Calculus itself, yeah, there's just a couple of rules to remember, which is why we like this. We like these steps of doing the calculus. That's everything else that's a little bit of a challenge. All right, so really, I just look at it. It's there's three things to do: find what we're trying to optimize, get an equation for it, make sure it's only one variable, and then you do the calculus. However, those are easier said than done, and so let me talk about some sort of like subsets in here, some other things um, that I do that help me with this. You know, kind of like I said, I'm going to call this number one, but it's not the very first thing I do. Here are some other things that you can do to help you get to these equations and whatnot. I'm a huge fan of, one, drawing pictures. Do yourself a favor and draw the picture. And it doesn't have to be a great picture. Just think about with my little rectangular field, I drew a rectangle. Because it prompted me to go, oh, yeah, I'm finding area of a rectangle. Area is x times y. We're going to see other times where you draw the picture and you go, oh, I can use the Pythagorean theorem to help me out. Or, oh, I've got this or that or the other thing, right? So draw a picture. Okay. Another thing that I do, I'm going to put here read, but I'm going to put read carefully. Keyword carefully because so much of what you need to know is given to you. And if you read closely and carefully, you'll get the information that you need. It will tell you what you're optimizing, it will get you the constraint, it will like you'll have all this stuff. So read it very carefully. All right. So draw the picture, read carefully. Um, and then another thing that's kind of helpful is use charts, and I put here slash lists, meaning when you read one of these things carefully, there's a lot of information in there and it can get kind of cluttered. Pull it out. Pull it out, write it separately, write the key things. So like in that example that we just did, um, some things that you could write to kind of get the information out is go find area of rectangle. 
perimeter equals 1,000 feet, right? Like condense all those horrible words into just a small little chunk of stuff that you can then go back and reference. And you've already sifted through all the nonsense. So um, these are just some other things that you can do to help you get to the find the equation that we're trying to optimize and get it in terms of one variable. All right. Um, for sure, look for constraints. Maybe I'll even put that as a separate thing here. Right, remember the constraints, these are the restrictions. Because you usually have those, not always, but you usually have constraints. Um, and so finding them is going to be necessary. All right, so just some tips on things that you can do to help you when it comes time to optimize. All right, so let's try another one. Um, this is another one that's going to be, uh, actually, no, I was going to do another area one. How about we'll do a volume one? All right, so here's the scenario now. Suppose that we have a, uh, that we manufacture cans. Okay, so we've got a, a business that is creating cans that, you know, soup cans cans for you know vegetables like whatever right but we're, we're going to try to we're going to construct cans now cans of course are cylindrical right they're cylindrical and they've got a top and a bottom and um so here's the scenario for these let's say we're told we know how much volume it needs to have right so the, the company tells us hey we want you to make a can that's going to hold, say, 150 cubic inches. OK, so it's going to be 150 cubic inches. But what we want to do is make it such that we're spending as little money as possible on the materials. OK, so let me just tell you, uh, let me just give you this information. So here's our situation. We're making a can. I'll even put here cylindrical. So we don't have to worry about that. But we're making a cylindrical can. To hold 150, I'm going to go to cubic centimeters. Let's just go metric. So 150 cubic centimeters or 150 cc's. Um, we know that the top of the can so the top and we'll go and bottom they cost one cent per square centimeter Okay, so basically it's a cost per area. The more area, the more it's gonna cost. Right? So um, the top and the bottom of the can cost one cent per square in a centimeter. And the sides, or the side of it, costs 0 0.9 cents per square centimeter. So the sides of the can are a little bit cheaper to make than the top and the bottom. But here's what I want to do. I want to figure out what dimensions make the can cheapest or least expensive.
All right, so here's an optimization problem. So notice that it is optimization because we're trying to minimize, right? We want least expensive. So we're trying to minimize our cost. So the example we just did was a maximization. Uh, maximization. This is a minimization. It doesn't really change what we're gonna do. But just notice that it's still optimization. So we're trying to minimize cost. All right, so let's do our thing. So first, we need to get an equation for what we're trying to minimize. Well, it's least expensive, so we're trying to minimize cost. So let's see if we can get an equation that um, gives us the cost of the can. All right, well, first, let's draw a picture. So we've got a can, it's a cylindrical can. So it's got a top and a bottom that are circles. And then the side is the cylinder itself. All right, so cost, the total, let's put here total cost. This is gonna equal the cost to make the top plus the cost of the bottom plus the cost of the side, right? So if we figure out how much it costs to make the top, we add to that how much it costs to make the bottom. And then we add to that the amount of cost for the side. We add them up, that's gonna get us our total cost. So that's what we're trying to optimize. All right, so to figure out the cost of these things, we need to know their areas, right? Because we've got a cost per area for the top and bottom. We've got a cost per area for the sides. So let's get the area. So what do you need? to find the area of a circle. What information tells you the area of a circle? Radius and pi. Yeah, we just need the radius, right? Because it's good old pi r squared. So let's put on our picture up here, r for our radius. So that means then that the cost of the top is gonna be one times pi r squared. So if we know that radius, pi r squared is its area and we multiply by one because it was one cent per square centimeter. We also need the cost of the bottom and the cost of the bottom is gonna be exactly the same because those circles are the same size, they got the same area and the cost per area is the same. Okay, so there's the cost of the top plus the cost of the bottom. All right, so now we need the cost of the side. So the side is gonna be 0 0.9 times its area. Hmm, how am I gonna find the area of the side? Any ideas there? Well, is it going to depend on R? Like if R changes, is the area, the surface area of the side of the can going to be more if R gets bigger? Do you mean the length? Yeah, hopefully you're all good with that, right? It definitely depends yeah. on you. Um, and so then, uh, Susanna, you just said the length. What do you mean by the length? Like how uh, from the top to the bottom of the can, how, how much does that measure? Okay, that's clearly gonna matter too, right? Yeah. Because if, if that can is the taller, height. right? Because if it's a wide can, or is it, is, it, is it a wide can or is it a narrow can? Yeah, exactly. Is it, 
the, the taller the can is, the more area we need. The fatter the can, the wider the can, the more area we need, right? So it's going to depend not just on R, but it's also going to depend on how tall it is. So on my picture here, I'm going to call that H for height. But it's definitely going to depend on the height of the can. And um, Alia, you just said height times circumference. All right, very good. Turns out that the area of that thing, of that side, is going to be the height times the circumference of the circle. So it's going to be 2 pi rh. And before you start freaking out on me and start going, yeah, well, that's great for Alia, but what happens to me when I have to do this kind of problem? Let me show you how you can deconstruct this. Um, give me one second here, because I wander over and find a piece of paper. So here is the side of the can. The side of the can is going to be a rectangle. You can imagine if here's our can, right? And then I take something and I cut it. I can unpeel it and I get a rectangle. So if we come back to how this can was oriented, notice that this is my height. This length is my height. Well, that's this part of the rectangle. The other side of the rectangle is up here, and that was the circle. So that's why it's circumference of the circle, circumference of the circle times height. All right, so very good, Alia. Thank you for that. All right, so here's our circumference formula then. We've got the circum, or sorry, not sorry, the cost formula. The cost is equal to two pi r squared plus 1.8 pi r h. So if you tell me the radius and you tell me the height, I plug those numbers in here and that's how much it's gonna cost in cents to make this can. All right, so that was step number one in my list. Step number one was find an equation for the thing that you're trying to optimize. We just found an equation for cost. Yay. But now we need to do the next step, which is get this so that it's only in terms of one variable. Okay, so somehow we have to replace the R with the H or vice versa. All right, well, this is where the constraint's going to come in because we can't just have any old R and H. There's a restriction on what they can be, and that's given by this very first sentence. We're making a cylindrical can that holds 150 cubic centimeters. So the R's and the H's, they, they can change, but we have to have it such that the volume is 150 cubic centimeters. So let's build our constraint from that. So we need to know the volume of a cylindrical can. Anyone remember the formula for that? Just out of curiosity. It's not looking like it. It's pi r squared h. That's the volume of a cylinder. Think about the pi r squared, that's that area of the circle. And then times h, we're just taking that circle and dropping it the entire length of the can, and that gets our volume. And we know that volume is 150 cubic centimeters. 
And so here is our constraint function. Here is the restriction on what R and H can be. So they can't just be anything we want. They're restricted in this way. All right, but that is what we can use to substitute in here. So I need to either solve that for R or for H. I highly recommend you solve it for H. It's going to be a little bit easier. But let's do that and plug it in. So we know that H is actually equal to 150 over pi R squared. So that's going to give us our cost function then is 2 pi R squared plus 1.8 pi R times 150 over pi R squared. H is equal to 150 over pi r squared. So let me just simplify that just a little bit further here. So you've got 2 pi r squared. Um, in the second thing, the pi's are going to cancel. One of the r's is going to cancel. So we're left with 150 times 1.8, uh, 12, I think that's 270, I think. Please check me on that. But we're going to get 270 over R. All right, cool. Thanks for that, Alia. She confirmed my 270. All right, so there we just did step number two. Step number two is turn that equation into one of just one variable. But just so you know, the hard part is done. Now we're ready to just go into cruise control. We're going to look at this function and we're going to optimize it. So we're going to differentiate it. Take that derivative, see where it's zero, where it's undefined, find critical points, blah, blah, blah. All right, but again, think about what we did. I started with, what am I optimizing? And I even, like, let me look at it. I put it in words first. The total cost was the cost of the top plus the cost of the bottom plus the cost of the side. Then I started piecing those together. And once I got to that, to the, I got this to a point where well, I was pretty much done, except for having two letters. That's where I used the constraint to get me down to just the one variable. All right, so any questions before we do the calculus on this? All right, hearing then and seeing then. Let's go ahead and do the calculus. All right, so we don't need any of this information anymore. So let's get a C prime. So C prime is going to equal, well, differentiating, that's going to give me 4 pi r minus 270 over r squared. So I'm just using the power rule. Just recognize that that second one is 270r to the minus 1. So we get a minus r to the minus 2. And I'm going to go ahead and make this a single fraction. Just going to combine them. So we get 4 pi r cubed minus 270 over r squared. So there's my derivative. So now let's find our critical points. So one set of critical points comes from where this derivative equals zero. Since it's a fraction, that's just going to be where the top equals zero. So 
So if I move stuff around, I get four cubed equals 270 over four pi. So R is gonna be the cube root of 270 over four pi. So that's actually gonna make my derivative equal zero. I also need to look for where this thing is undefined. Well, that's when the fraction's bottom is equal to zero, which is r equals zero. So we have two critical points, the cube root of 270 over four pi and zero. All right, so now the question is, which of those gives us a maximum? Or sorry, a minimum, we're trying to minimize cost. Well, let's first look at this guy, r equals zero. What do you guys think about r equals zero? You should actually all have a real big problem with r equals zero. Yeah, if r is equal to zero, there's no can. Eric just put that in the, in the chat box. There's no can. And then uh, Bailey's like, yeah, it doesn't work. Um, Ollie's like, it won't hold much soup. Yeah, uh, r equals zero, while mathematically is an interesting point in the real world. It's a silly answer. So we're not even gonna worry about this one. I'm just gonna cross it off and I'm just gonna say that this fails reality. Okay, it just, it doesn't even make sense for what we're trying to do. We're not gonna be able to hold 150 cubic centimeters of anything if R is equal to zero. Okay, so we're gonna rule that one out which means really our only good choice is this cube root of 270 over four pi. So uh, let me actually figure out what that's equal to or a decimal approximation for it. It's right around 2.78. All right, so this is around. 2.78 centimeters. It's 2.78000416, blah, blah, blah. So I figured we can call that 2.78. All right, so that one's 2.78. So will that give us actually the minimum cost? Well, we'd have to actually look at, um, do a test on it, either the first derivative test or the second derivative test. I'm gonna use the second derivative test again, just so you can see how fast it can be. Um, if I take the second derivative of this, C double prime, it's gonna be four pi plus 540 over R cubed. And just notice that if I put in a positive R, this is gonna be a positive number. So it's concave up at this point, which means I'm at a minimum. Okay, so I know for sure this does give us a min. So we're gonna minimize our cost if we make it so that the radius of this is 2.78 centimeters. And then the height is gonna be whatever this gives us once we plug in that 2.78 and we solve for H. So those would be the dimensions to minimize the cost of this can. 
All right, so I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Next time you're at the grocery store, going down an aisle that has all the cans, I want you just to look at this. I want you to notice that all of the cans have the same shape, same size, right? There are some variations, but like think about um, like, you know, a, a can of uh, corn, can of peaches, a can of chili, things like that. Those things are all the same size. Some of the ones that are variations like the Campbell's soup, those things are a little bit smaller. Um, the reason they're a smaller size is because they hold a different amount, right? Um, or some of the other soups can uh, have, but in general, there are only a couple of specific sizes for cans. And it's not coincidence. This was done by somebody at some point when they're like, hey, we want to make cans that hold this much volume, but we want to make it as cheap as possible. They did the math and that came up with the size of your can of peaches. Now they're those same sizes so that we have regularity. Um, I'm sure that the cost formula has changed, but you also know how we are. Like humans don't like change. We like things to stay the same. Um, and so, well, our cans of peaches are always this size. So we continue to make them this size. But originally, the reason that they have the dimensions that they do was to minimize cost. So, fun fact. Anyway, so there's another optimization problem. Um, okay, so Ali, you just said, what if I hadn't found that it was concave up at that point? Ooh, that's a good question. What if? it didn't actually match, right? What if it had been concave down? So this was a local max. Well, where else can I get um, extrema other than critical points? What are other options? What did the extreme value theorem tell us? Where else could we have them? Okay, good. So all of you just put uh, endpoints if you have them. And that's what we would have to do. We'd have to look at the endpoints. And in lots of applications, there are smallest and biggest possibilities. Like um, go back to that field example. There is a smallest that we could make the width of the field, zero feet. There is a biggest we could have made the width of the field, 500 feet. And 500 feet and then 500 feet back. Um, so we get to check, check the points 0 and 500. Uh, this one's a little bit harder to find the possibilities. Um, but that, that is a good question. And thank you for bringing that up. If that were to happen, you need to find endpoints. And your extremes are going to be at the endpoints, or at one of the endpoints. All right, so um, another example of optimization. Um, on Monday, we're going to do a couple more. I, I don't think we're quite ready for, uh, for you guys to go flying on your own. You can definitely try them, start setting them up, start working on the homework. Um, but on Monday, we'll do a couple more just to kind of refresh our memory and, and see some other possibilities. I'll show you the, oh, the one we call the lifeguard problem, um, which is a pretty big one, actually. Um, and so uh, we'll do a few more of those, and then we'll keep looking at things you can do with derivatives. All right. So with that, have a wonderful weekend. Don't forget that there is another homework set coming up due um, Monday night at midnight, but you got plenty of time. Um, but other than that, survive the last Friday of the 13th of uh, 2020, and I will see everybody on Monday. Cheers.